Good evening, everyone. Um, like Emily said, very pleased that you could come and uh, weathering the, the slush. And uh, as Emily said, my name is Ali Yazdani. I'm a, a member of the Aspen Center for Physics. Um, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to this public lecture. The Nick and Maggie Duo Foundation funds these lectures. And uh, through their generosity, we've been able to have this lecture for the last 30 years. And um, it gives us the opportunity to have one of our um, participants who's uh, a star of, the, of one of our conferences, which I'll tell you about in a second, present to you a new research that's going on uh, in physics and uh, at the frontier of our field. Now, each year uh, during the winter uh, months, uh, every week, different groups of physicists come to the Aspen Center for Physics for an intense workshop, uh, which uh, takes place uh, first formally in this room, and then informally on the slopes and on the, <laughs> uh, on the trails. And uh, a lot of really important ideas in physics have actually been hatched uh, in, here in Aspen over the years. And we'd like to take this opportunity to thank the community uh, for hosting us. Now, um, uh, I've been coming here for uh, 26 years. Uh, it's my 26 years of skiing, so I'm, I'm very thankful for the center. So tonight we are very fortunate uh, to uh, have uh, Pablo Jairo Herrero uh, from Massachusetts Institute of Technology uh, as our public speaker. Um, the subject of our uh, week's conference this week is on a new class of what we call quantum materials. Uh, quantum materials are materials in which quantum degree of freedom is to rise to very exotic properties for electrons. And these electronic properties may have applications, of course. It gives us new ways in which we can understand so the concepts such as quantum entanglement, new quantum phases of matters. And Pablo's has been a uh, his contribution, has been significant in basically creating this field in which we are having the conference about here in Aspen. We are very fortunate to have him as our public speaker. Let me tell you a little bit about Pablo. He's from Spain, he's from Valencia, where he was an undergraduate. Then he went to, be, to get his PhD from Delft Institute of Technology in the Netherlands. And he came to MIT in 2008, where he has been a professor since, and he's now the Celia and Ida Green uh, Professor of Physics. And um, he uh, has won many awards and accolades uh, for his uh, contribution, especially the one that funds our, our conference here this week. I'll just mention a few of them. He's a recipient of the, of the oldest American Physical Society prizes called the Oliver Buckley Prize. And he is a, a member of uh, US National Academy of Sciences. Now, I've known Pablo a long time, but this week I discovered something I didn't know about him. First, this is his first time in Aspen in the winter. And uh, during uh, uh, one of our uh, ski excursion, uh, he told us that he knew about Aspen when he was a teenager in this movie. Aspen Extreme. <laughs> I don't know how many of you have seen this movie. Okay, very good. So you can see how this could be a, a big impressionistic <laughs> event for a young Pablo, <laughs> the warm Spain, dreaming of becoming an extreme skier and everything that goes along with it, apparently, in that movie. <laughs> now, we are very fortunate that his family dissuaded him of this. Uh, of uh, momentary, uh, uh, momentary desire, and, and that he has become an extreme physicist uh, for us to have this uh, opportunity to do the kind of research we are doing, you'll hear about today. So let's welcome Pablo. <laughs> thank you very much, Ali. Um, I want to thank you all for being here. It's really a pleasure. What Ali is saying is true. You know, I saw this movie that triggered me to start skiing in Spain. At some point, I told my mom, I think I want to be a ski instructor. And she sort of, like, psh, psh, you know, just <laughs> go back to high school, study, and then we'll see, you know. And here I am. But I was so excited when I got the invitation to, to join, uh, you know, this conference in Aspen. You know, it's really, I already, you know, went to the stops a couple of days ago. 
And I'm not quite as good as the skiers in the movie, you know, but okay, <laughs> I'll do my best. So thank you everyone for being here. It's really a great pleasure. And I wanna tell you about this thing called magic angle graphene, which, you know, uh, any, you know, someone told me this is a twist and shout of quantum materials and, you know, this is obvious and I'll tell you a little bit about what the shout is about. Mm -hmm. So before I start, I wanna do something more, more general in physics. And by the way, this talk is gonna have sort of two components. Initially, it may seem a bit advanced, but then I promise it's going to get easier before it gets a little bit more advanced, okay? But I think there will be enough for all of you. I hear there's some people who have you know, their daughter as a physicist and so on. So I hope there's a little bit of enough for, 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 missing, for most of you to, to at least get some message home. So um, I want to tell you about something called strongly correlated states of matter. What does that mean? That means the following. You know, materials, matter, the universe is made of particles. And sometimes, you know, the interaction between the particles doesn't matter for the behavior that you're looking at. And other times, most, you know, some of the most fascinating states of matter and, and objects that we have in the universe are those where the interaction between the in individual constituents that make up that matter are very strong. Okay? And then we get very exotic type of phenomena. And that's the kind of thing I'm gonna be talking about. This is something that happens in, you know, everywhere in, in physics. For example, right after the Big Bang, yeah, there is this thing called the quark gluon plasma, which is a very strongly interacting state of particles called quarks and gluons, you know, make nuclei. And we can recreate nowadays this behavior at the beginning of the universe by smashing atoms against each other in these you know, laboratories such as Brookhaven National Laboratory in New York. <clears throat> In, you know, in the universe in general, in the galaxies, you, you, know, you can find neutron stars. And that, you know, a neutron star is a star which is made all of neutrons, okay? And neutron stars, those neutrons interact very strongly with each other and create different phases of nuclear matter in neutron stars. And it's very interesting, if you go to Wikipedia, these phases are called nuclear pasta. So there is a spaghetti phase, a bucatini phase, a lasagna phase, you know. The astrophysicists always have glorious pictures and beautiful names for what they do, you know. We're, we're jealous in my field always of the astrophysicists. And then a bit closer to the type of stuff that I do, you put electrons and they start interacting very strongly with each other. Then you can have these different biological states of matter, okay? States of matter where mathematics plays a very special role, okay? in their state of that matter and can lead to very exotic things. For example, particles that rather than, you know, electrons that rather than having an electron charge, you know, you, you, you have, there are not electrons, we call them positive particles, which have a fraction of an electron charge, you know. Things that you cannot realize if you just throw an electron to the air, but when you have many electrons interacting very strongly with each other, you can have those types of behaviors. Now, this, as I said, this is strongly correlated states of matter happening in all of physics. And the field that I work in, and that this, you know, the subject of conference this week is uh, you know, quantum materials. And these strongly correlated quantum materials, again, is electrons that play a very important role. One of the most, the most ex uh, famous examples, perhaps the most investigated example of a quantum material, are the high temperature, high critical temperature superconductors. Okay, it's a picture of a, uh, you know, a, a superconductor which is floating, you know, in the magnetic field, you know, created by a magnet. Or vice versa, you can do the trick either way because superconductors spell magnetic field. These high temperature Cooper superconductors is a very exotic class of materials that were discovered, discovered in the late 80s. And you look at what happens when you add charge to this material, that is called doping. And when you vary the temperature at which this material is subject to, we have something which is called a phase diagram. Now, each of these names here, mod, strange metal, pseudo gap, thermal liquid, these are different phases, okay? different behaviors that this material can exhibit. We call them different phases of quantum matter. It turns out we almost don't understand any of them, <laughs> these materials, yeah? It's extremely difficult to calculate the properties of these materials theoretically. Okay? I'll tell a, a few more words about that. So, but before we go to this type of very exotic materials, let me tell you something which is a bit simpler, okay? So physics, you know, we have something that we call single particle physics. That means we can put each of those individual constituents separately. Yeah, they don't care about each other. That very basic description of physics, called single particle physics, gives us a good understanding of a lot of materials, actually. For example, in single particle physics, you can have two types of 
materials from the electronic point of view can have metals, for example, gold. Okay, it's a good metal, typically shiny. You can have insulators, for example, diamond. Okay? Now, besides being used in jewelry, these two materials are used in very sophisticated technologies nowadays. It's not only this kind of jewelry, but you know, gold is used in you know, uh, microprocessors. Diamond is one of the best quantum sensors for computing. And now, quantum information element. And then, so this is what happens when you have metals that don't interact with each other. We can have something called correlated insulators. Okay? And that is something that occurs when these electrons interact very strongly with each other. And one example is these high temperature superconductors. Turns out these high temperature superconductors, they're very exotic. Okay? And they're also used in some of the most advanced technologies that we have nowadays. For example, some of you may have heard about fusion. It's technology that may revolutionize energy generation. Okay, not there yet. It's always been 50 years away, but now we think it's only 20 years away instead of 50 because of a recent breakthrough in which they could create special magnets with these high temperature superconductors, which allows now confined plasma, which is used in these fusion reactors. Yeah? So all of these materials, you know, whether they are described by single particle physics or whether they're more exotic, have actually applications in very uh, you know, advanced technologies. So let me give you an example of this, one of these correlated insulators. Okay, so they're called multi insulators. So what does this mean? You know, let's, let's take this square lattice of atoms. In each of these atoms, I can put two electrons. Okay? An electron would spin up, an electron would spin down. Some of you may have heard about that word spin. If not, it doesn't matter. Now, let's imagine I put just one electron per atom here. Okay, and this arrow is the spin pointing. This, you know, in single particle physics, this electron doesn't care that there's an electron there because they don't interact with each other. Now, in reality, many materials, electrons, well, everywhere, electrons repel each other. But in some materials, this pulsion is particularly strong, such that if an electron wants to jump from here to here, you cannot do it. Yeah? There's an energy cost, an energy penalty to jump in. <clears throat> Those type of insulators, you know, are called motor insulators. And because the electrons cannot jump between the different sites, they're all stuck in their locations. That's why they are insulators. In order to have a metal, you need to conduct, the electrons need to move. These are all stuck in their positions, okay? Now, let's do the following. Let's imagine that we have one electron now per copper atom. No, so this is a high temperature copper superconductor, it's copper and oxygen atoms. The oxygen atoms, don't think about them, because the electrons go into the copper atoms. If you have one, each of these, you have a mode insulator, as I just mentioned. Now let's imagine that you remove a few of those electrons. We say we dope material with holes. The hole is the absence of an electron. If we remove a few of these electrons, now this electron here, for example, can actually jump this empty site because there's no electron there repelling. Okay? But it cannot jump to the next. So if I have a few of those holes, now the electrons can jump certain places. They have to do this in a correlated fashion. They can intercount if there's another one or not there. Okay? And this special correlated motion of electrons gives rise almost magically okay, to superconductivity. Now, not only superconductivity, but the highest temperature superconductivity that we have under ambient conditions. I mean, under ambient pressures. It's still a bit no, low temperatures. Now, the model that we think describes this behavior is a model you know, in honor of a physicist that, that studied this thing, John Hubbard. It takes into account that energy penalty, but also the, the, the T means the, the energy that you gain you know, when you hop between empty and an occupied site. And we think that this model, okay, which is very simple, you just take whether you know, think the electrons can jump from site to site, they can also repel each other. That model, we think, describes this phase diagram of the high temperature Cooper superconductors. But we just think it or believe it. We don't know, actually, because it's impossible for theoretical physicists to calculate even this very simple model. Why? Because you have trillions and trillions of electrons all interacting with each other. We don't know how to calculate that even in our best computers. Yeah? You can calculate the properties of the system for a few electrons, five or six, something like that, maybe 10, a good day. Again, okay? on a supercomputer on a good day. But the moment you have you know, thousands, we can do that. You have 10 to the 20 electrons as in a material you have 
no way, nothing, okay? So due to this difficulty in, in calculating mathematically properties of these materials, the community has been trying to realize alternative platforms, you know, see if we can do something else, you know, in order to understand the behavior of strongly correlated electrons. So one of the most successful approaches, and perhaps, you know, I know there, are many, there have been many Aspen conferences on this subject, so perhaps some of you have attended public lectures on this, is to use ultra cold atoms in optical lattices to do quantum simulations of materials. And so what does this mean? This means is you can shine lasers at each other. Lasers create this potential, you know, like a wavy potential where you can load atoms, you know, one by one. Yeah. This is like, you know, like X in an egg. So, and now with this atomic physicists, they can change the interaction between these atoms, okay? Such that you can realize, you know, 20 years ago, they realized they were able to realize mod insulator, and then they change the interaction between the atoms and they could get a superfluid, you know, something that is similar to superconductor. They did this many years ago with a special type of atom called bosonic atoms, where they have an integer spin the atoms. Then a few, Years later, this was done for muonic atoms, half integer spins. Electrons are actually uh, fermions, they have half integer spins. So, this was sort of closer to the kind of things that we do in condensed matter physics. And the latest that people have been doing in this community is that they've been able to realize anti ferromagnetism. That means the spins alternate up, on, up, down, up, down. You know? So, if you look at this lattice, you can see that you know, this is the ideal. This is what the pictures look like. You see, white, blue, white, blue, white, blue. That means the spins of the atoms are alternating. So in this community, they're exploring this corner, of this phase diagram. You see, it says here, anti-ferromagnet. It says mod. We like to explore the entire phase diagram, look at everything. However, it's extremely difficult for them because they have to go down to very low temperatures, particular to explore this D-wave superconducting region, a special type of superconductivity, which is the one that happens with high temperature superconductors. So, but you know, they're trying to cover all of this. And they need to, you know, they're working at temperatures of nano Kelvin, so 0 0.801 Kelvin near absolute zero and freezing. It's colder than out here in the mountains. Yeah. And they think they have to cool down factor of 10 or 100 even lower in temperature, which these regions. And although it's not impossible, it's very hard to do technically and therefore progress is slowing down. Okay. So we have these two traditional platforms to look at strongly interacting systems of electrons. We have real quantum materials. This is what the lattice looks like for one of those high temperature superconductors. The lattice scale, the separation between the atoms, you can have an angstrom or so, a few angstroms, you know, 0.1 nanometers. You have these other more recent platform, the cold atoms in optical lattices, here because they use light. The wavelength of light is of order a micron. The separation between these atoms is of order one micron to the minus six meters, this is 10 to the minus 10 meters. What I wanna tell you about today is about a new platform. My, my group helped create, but a lot of people in the community you know, are, are, are working on and, and are contributing towards creating, which is based on magic angle graphene and related systems. Where we're going to superimpose two periodic structures. I'll show you in a moment how we do this. Create something similar to this, but where we can see a lot of the stuff that happens here. Okay? And this super lattice length, okay? So for that 10 nanometers. So it's about a factor 100 from this and a factor 100 from this, an intermediate and complementary platform to investigate the physics of strong interacting electrons. Now these lengths have associated with them energies or temperature scales. So the physics that happens in quantum materials very often is of order 100 or 1000 Kelvin. I told you already that in cold atoms, we have to go to extremely cold temperatures, 0.11 nanokelvin. That has to do largely with the fact that these objects are much further apart. Here, because we're in between, we are exploring temperatures of the order of one to 100 Kelvin, which is very cold for daily life, but it's a very convenient temperature scale to investigate in a solid state physics laboratory. We have switches, cryostats that routinely go to those temperatures. We can investigate this. Initially, the development, that enable to this magic angle platform, okay? Something that we call now often twistronics. And it's the fact that we can do something that it was impossible to do in the history of material science until uh, you know, 
until a decade or so ago. We can now take two-dimensional material, one atom thick, put on top of another one, and put it on top with any angle of rotation, with any twist angle between the two materials. We can do something like this, yeah? We can put materials on top of each other with an arbitrary angle of rotation, something that was impossible to do in the history of material science before, but now that we can do it, and I'll show you how we do it, it turns out the properties, the combined layer system, depend extremely, you know, very sensitively on what is the angle between the two sheets, yeah? Very dramatically, electronic, the optical, the mechanical properties. And you can choose any angle that we want, you know, one degree, 50 degrees, 60 degrees. I'll show you that 1.1 degree, a very special angle, the magic angle. And I'll tell you a little bit about it. And now I brought here some ups, you know, so that I'm gonna pass it around so that you can play in real, right, in real life. You know, you see this thing rotates and you can see this more effect, you know, so I'm, I'm gonna pass it around. You know, two different sizes. Please make sure it comes back to me. I only have these two. Okay. Now, using this Twistronics platform, yeah, which you know, another word for it is called, you know, more quantum matter. This quantum material is now we call them more quantum matter. More has to do with is this this you know I think you all see here that there is you know a pattern that emerges with the distance you know between the pattern that varies as the twist angle changes. So that is a moiré pattern, it's called, it comes from textiles. And you can also see it when you have the mosquito nets to mosquito nets at an angle and you can see that there is this moiré patterns. So this moiré quantum matter, you know, it turns out this is quite a bit of, you know, magic. It's not real magic, but it's almost magical that it produces so much. Within the span of a few years, about five years, we have been able to realize this moiré quantum matter, pretty much all of the quantum phases of matter that we knew and that have been discovered before for, you know, for 100 years. We have correlated insulators, superconductors, various topological phases. We have magnetism, hematicity, ferroelectricity, strange metal, beam crystals, excitonics insulators, quasar crystals, everything, you know, almost that we have in condensed matter physics, in the physics of quantum materials, has been realized within the last few years using very simple ingredients and this, you know, these same tricks. Yeah. So this is sort of what I want to tell you about today. So this is, you know, this was a long introduction, but this is the outline of my talk, okay? the twist and the shout. The twist, you know, I'll explain to you. And so now it's going to be a bit easier, actually. I'm going to start very simple. I'm going to tell you what the materials are, graphene, I told you about Legoland, Twistronics. Then I'll, I'll get a tiny bit more technical. I'll tell you about what graphene specifically is and specifically what magic angle graphene is. And then I'll tell you what the discovery, you know, that my group made in 2018 was, you know, able to realize correlated insulators and superconductivity using this platform. And then I'll tell you a little bit about what, where the community is, is going and some of the things that are being discussed this week in Aspen, okay? I'll try to, you know, go quickly through all of this, okay? And, and hopefully we make it in time for dinner. So, the materials, Legon and Twistronics. So, let me start very simple, okay? What do I mean by 2D? It means two-dimensional, okay? Let's imagine you have a deck of cards. Okay. This is a bulk object, definitely 3D. It has some you know, width, some length, and some height. Let's imagine now that I start you know, breaking apart this, you know, this deck of cards until I end up with just one card. Yeah, a card has length and a width, but barely any height. Okay? Well, that is still super thick compared to what I'm talking about. Okay? So the kind of thing that I'm talking about in 2D material is materials which are one atom in thickness. And it turns out that when you make a material from bulk onto one atom in thickness, the properties of the materials can change. So let's imagine, imagine I have here an apple, okay? You all know how an apple looks, tastes, smells. Let's imagine I cut it in slices, okay? We have here a slice of an apple. Do you think it tastes Similar to a chunk of apple? Yes, right? Well, the materials that we're looking at, their properties are so different when you get down to one layer compared to the bulk. And it's like if a slice of an apple tasted like an orange, you know, completely different, okay? That's some of the very exotic behavior that we are trying to understand or investigate Now, where did the first dimensional material come out? Where was it investigated? 
Well, it's everywhere actually. It's in, you know, it's graphite. It comes from graphite, which is a material with, you know, the tip of your pencil is made of, okay? And you write with a pencil, what you're doing in reality, you don't see it, but what you're doing is take the graphite, which is at the tip. Graphite, the layered material is like a deck of cards and you're doing spreading cards on the table, on the piece of paper, okay? That's how a pencil works. So if you look, at a pencil, at the tip of a pencil, which is graphite, it looks like this. You see already here the rasters, okay? But well, those are not actually 2D materials, those are chunks of car. You zoom in a bit more, you can see thinner things. They're still chunks of, of the deck of cards, okay, of graphite. And only, you know, here, for example, you can see a faint step in here and here. That might be actually a single step of graphene. Now, this is what the graphene looks like. It's a honeycomb of carbon atoms. These are all carbon atoms arranged in this honeycomb, like chicken wire, okay? It's one atom thick. It's the thinnest material that exists and that it will ever exist. Nothing thinner than one atom in thickness, okay? The thinnest material that exists. This material, okay, it was not believed to exist, okay? People knew that graphite was made of graphene, but they thought that if you take this one piece of graphene out, it would sort of disintegrate in the air or something like that. You know? There is even a theorem in physics that says that it shouldn't exist. Don't trust theorems, yeah, in general. So it took two very creative and you'd almost say crazy scientists, you know, to dare do this thing, you know, with graphite that I just showed you on, this, on the screen. I mean, I'll show you a bit more now. Discovered and isolate graphene. This happened in 2004, Andrew Geim and Kostya Novoselov. And they used, you know, the way they did it was so simple that people didn't believe it to start with, but when they said how they did it, people believed it even less, okay? So, because it was too crazy and too, you know, how can this be? They used graphite powder, okay? basically a pencil, and scotch tape, literally, okay? to make this discovery. What they did is the following. You take graphite, Okay, it's actually my hand. Yeah. You take graphite and you put a flake of graphite, and there's like a deck of cards, onto a piece of scotch tape. And you fold the piece of scotch tape in two. Now you separate it. Your scotch tape is sticky. Half of the deck of cards, half of the graphite is on either of these two. Yeah. You separate like that. Now you shift the scotch tape a little bit and you repeat it. How do you make this into four pieces or, you know, and into eight, 16, 32? You do this until you get bored, more or less, okay? And when you're bored, it looks something like this, you know, many, many, many pieces of graphite, yeah? And then what you do is you take a substrate, this is a silicon chip, you know, similar to the ones that is in your computer, but thin, without all the electronics. <laughs> then you press scotch tape, pressing down where the graphite is, press it on top. And you remove it. And amazingly, you then go and look at the silicon substrate. Every now and then, you mostly see silicon, nothing. Every now and then, you see something like this. This is a single layer of graphene, an atom thick. You can see it with your eyes, actually. It's extraordinary. You can see it with your eyes. And this is a, a little bit thicker layer. This is three pieces of graphene. This is a mono layer of graphene. And it's a pretty long piece, 100 microns. Now, what is we can do this size, okay? And using scotch tape. This is done with scotch tape in my lab. So it was crazy that, you know, you tried this. It was crazy that it worked. And they were very lucky that you could see it with your eye because they could just see it. So for, if you, if you look, you know, this is the way it looks optically. It's very thin, but you don't see the atoms. The atoms are very small. Okay? But if you go to a transmission electron microscope, a machine that allows you to see atoms, this is how graphene looks like. Okay. These are the carbon, the individual carbon atoms. It's what thought is a single carbon atom. Now, for their isolation of graphene and the beginning of this you know, field of 2D materials, the guy and Kostin Evozolov received the 2010 Nobel Prize in Physics, okay? <coughs> People call it the Scotch Tape Nobel Prize. We need a lot more, okay, than Scotch Tape in. Now, so 
So that was 2010, but you know, if we go back, you know, in 2005, you know, this is the way I looked, you know, 2005, I was doing my PhD, finishing my PhD in the Netherlands, as, as Ali mentioned, in Delft, the beautiful town, you know, a, a cute little town in the Netherlands. I was finishing and I was thinking, hmm, what should I do after finish my PhD? Okay. Usually when you finish your PhD, you do, you do something called a postdoc. You continue doing research, something else. I asked my PhD advisor, Leo Gawenhofen, and he said, have you heard about this amazing 2D material called graphene, which is brand new, you discovered. So I had not, but I looked at the paper and it seemed like really extraordinary. I could know, so it was hard to believe that it existed. But what I did is I went and I visited, you know, Andre and Kostia in Manchester. They were extremely generous. They were helping at that time, it was the beginning. And again, a lot of people were skeptic, were helping people come see it, it's for real, you know. I went there, they showed me and, and a whole bunch of other people that we came from Delft, how to do the scotch tape. We were all there like, really? Said, yeah, scotch tape. So we were there scotch taping, you know, back and forth. And we, I learned how to make graphene devices. But then when I went to MIT, okay, I started to do uh, research on graphene. In the middle, I spent also a year at Columbia, New York, where uh, another person, Philip Kim, with Mary, has made and continues to make many important contributions to graphene. And you know, I was doing research and I there, I actually learned more about graphene. Okay, so what's so special about graphene? Okay, well, it's the thinnest material that exists, very flexible, you know, it's like, it's like a sheet, think of it. At the same time, it's the strongest material in the world, by far. It's way stronger than steel, okay? Which is kind of crazy, because the bonds between these carbon atoms are very strong. It's Transparent, but at the same time conducts electricity. It's the best conductor, one of the best electronic conductors. There's so many things that it does where it is the best at, which is sort of a wonder material. Now, the behavior of electrons in graphene is unlike the behavior of electrons in any other material that we knew at the time. Okay? Electrons in materials roughly behave like tennis balls, you know, the air, kind of. Electrons in graphene behave very different. They behave more like the type of, you know, the particles, the ultra relativistic particles that we smash around in and we accelerate at high energy physics accelerators such as CERN that you may have heard about. Yeah? So, like if you, know, you could think of CERN as uh, electrons in graphene, like something like this. And in order to understand a little bit, to give you a flavor for how that works, let me tell you, you know, let me compare how tennis balls behave with how electrons in regular materials behave how electrons in graphene decay, okay? But let's take, you know, the laws of classical physics you know, that were established by Isaac Newton, which probably many of you have heard. <laughs> let's imagine we have Newton here, and rather than apples, let's give him a tennis ball. Let's put a wall in front of Isaac Newton, and let's ask Newton, just throw the tennis ball wall. Okay? As all of you know, tennis ball bounces back. Okay? That's what happens with tennis balls, with classical objects. The ball cannot go to the brick wall. Okay? <laughs> now, let's take quantum mechanics. Okay. Electrons in materials behave according to the laws, not of classical physics, but of quantum mechanics. So quantum physics, let's take one of the most famous quantum physicists, Erwin Schrodinger, and let's give him, you know, let's put a wall, and let's give him a tennis ball. There's here hidden a cat, but I didn't want to smash the cat against the wall. So let's give him a tennis ball and let's throw tennis balls, which are electrons in this case, okay? The, it mostly bounces back, but every now and then, tennis ball makes it through the wall. Mm -hmm. This thing is called quantum tunneling. It's a very exotic thing. At the beginning, people had a hard time imagining how that works. Turns out all the technology that you have, your cell phones, your computers, everything works based on this, okay? So it's an essential component of the structure of matter and to allow you know, things to behave the way they behave. Okay, so that's already weird. Mm -hmm. Let's take, Relativity, ultra relativistic particles, quantum ultra relativistic physics. Obviously, we have to choose Einstein for this experiment. So we give Einstein, you know, we put a wall and we give him tennis balls. Now we let Einstein throw ultra, relati ultra relativistic tennis balls to the wall. Turns out they all make it through. Ultra relativistic objects can go through obstacles. That is a very exotic thing, which People knew theoretically it should happen, but it had never been seen until graphene came and we did it. Oh, electrons in graphene can make it through obstacles. 
they, they behave like these ultra relativistic particles. This is called not regular quantum tunneling, but Klein tunneling. And that's part of the reason, not the whole reason, but part of the reason why graphene is such a good conductor. Usually in normal conductors, electrons are trying to make it through, but they bump into all kinds of things, okay? But electrons in graphene is like, doesn't matter, and bump into things, they go through them, okay? And that's why electrons conduct so well in graphene. Okay, now graphene is not the only 2D material. There are many other 2D materials, yeah? And for example, one of the most famous one is a hexagonal boron nitride. It's also a chicken wire, but now boron and nitrogen atoms alternating, yeah? On the hexagon. Turns out it's the thinnest insulator in the world, less than one nanometer in thickness. It will appear later in my talk too. You have materials like tungsten diselenide, okay? From the top, this one is three atoms in thickness, but it forms a single unit, you know, that thickness. And from the top, it also looks like alternating atoms of tungsten and selenium. This one is a semiconductor, and you put one layer, it emits light of a given color. You put two layers, it emits light of a different color, and so on and so forth, okay? In fact, in my lab, we, already a number of years ago, we made the world's thinnest LEDs, LED, less than one nanometer in thickness, okay? Take your hair, split it a thousand times, that thick, okay? Mm -hmm. So light source made from this, you know, to the material W selenide, it's a nice selenide. Okay, now we have many to the materials. Why don't we put them back on top of each other, okay? We can do that in any order that we want. We can take different materials and put them on top of each other and do all kinds of crazy things. I can do this configuration. I can do a different configuration, you know, in slightly different order. And all of these materials have different properties, etc. Okay, so you can imagine now we have millions and millions of combinations, you know, can play all we want. But this is something this, you know, which, which those of us with a sweet tooth remind us, reminds us of this, you know. So this is something that um, people call Lego lab, okay? So because similar to pieces of Lego that you can stack on top of each other, you can now combine different materials and stack them on top of each other. So with these papers, you know, and that's the 2D materials is like Lego land. Uh, you have played with Lego, I have small kids, so I play with Lego all the time. You realize that Lego pieces you have to, you know, to, you know sometimes my, my you know, youngest son comes and tells me, buddy, I can't put this Lego piece on top of the other, like it. Because you have to put them perfectly aligned. You know? Only then you can put them on top of each other, okay? So this Lego land aspect of 2D materials is important, but it misses the thing that you're playing with looking around. It misses the fact that we can actually now them at any angle. We don't need to stack them like in Lego. We can put these two D materials on top of each other at any arbitrary angle of rotation. Yeah. So that's you know, with my group, uh, you know, we, we started work on it a while ago, and 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 and, and it has really attracted a lot of attention. Okay. Let me go a little technical, and I think I'm going to have to accelerate, but it's okay. The technical part can accelerate. So this is the way graphene looked like. All of these are carbon atoms, but we have two types of carbon atoms. We'll, we call them A and B, okay? Because although chemically they're all carbon, they're identical from the crystallographic point of view, from the physical point of view, they're actually different, yeah? Anyway, the energy versus the momentum okay, of the electrons in graphene has this linear energy momentum dispersion. These are like, you know, those of you that follow Einstein and so on, you always have these cones of light. That's why electrons in graphene behave like that. Like, you know, ultra relativistic particles. Okay? I'm going to show one equation. It's the only one it's going to be in the talk. It's the Dirac equation in two dimensions for massless particles. Very exotic thing. You don't need to understand it. I just wanted to show it. You can say, people, I saw the Dirac equation, you know. <laughs> and the Dirac equation is important that the electrons can be on this A type of atoms or in this B type of atoms. Okay? You, you know, don't need to understand this. It doesn't matter. Now, you put graphene on top of graphene, you create a moiré pattern. And moiré wavelength, which means the distance between the soccer balls that you see here on the screen, depends on the twist angle, okay? Now, let me take two graphene sheets. So this is what happens when you put graphene sheets on top of each other in real space. Okay? Let me think about what happens to the energy of those electrons, you know, those cones that I showed you a moment ago. Because we have two graphene sheets, we have two of these cones, okay? And if electrons in one graphene sheet didn't know that the other graphene sheet exists, these cones, they would just interpenetrate each other. 
and they don't care about each other. Mm -hmm. However, when I put graphene on top of graphene, separation between the two graphene sheets is only a few angstroms, many. The electrons can jump. You say they can tunnel one graphene sheet to the other. And that tunneling hits that energy of that crossing point. Yeah? It leads to something we call band repulsion. It's like, I don't want to be so there are these bumps, yeah? And there is a parameter with which is called the interlayer tunneling, which governs that repulsion, yeah? And these two cones are closer or further apart depending on the rotation angle in the two graphene sheets. So if I decrease the twist angle, now rotate towards smaller and smaller and smaller angles, yeah? these two cones get closer and closer and closer, and this band repulsion that pushes one band, the energy of some of the electrons pushed down, push down all the way to zero, yeah? The electrons, at that moment, you no, know, you say that a flat band condition is realized. That means the electrons are there, have zero energy, okay? And this thing is realized at an angle, which is 1.1 degrees, very precise angle, okay? Depends on all the electrons tunnel between the two graphene sheets, function of angle. And it was, you know, pretty theoretically, there was a lot of interesting work, you know, about, uh, 10, 12 years ago along this subject. Back then, we were thinking about the electrons not interacting with each other, yeah? moving between the two graphene sheets, but not caring about the other electrons. <laughs> now, this is, you know, this thing I showed you is a cartoon. This is an actual calculation of the energy versus the momentum of the electrons. And you can see that now, rather than having these steep Dirac cones, we have this relatively flat pancake here. Okay? That's what the flat band is. Now, Flat in momentum space, for those of you that have done a little bit of, you know, you know have, especially if you have worked in, in math or in computer science, you do a Fourier transform, okay? You, know, you can look at how these electrons, when they are in this flat pancake, how do they distribute themselves? Where do they are? Where are they, sorry, in real space? It turns out the electrons like to accumulate themselves in regions where we call AA stacking, meaning you remember those A and B balls? where all the balls, all the atoms are on top of each other locally. Because we have a small twist angle, a little bit further, those carbon atoms get you know, out of registry. You have A, B stacking, and the electrons do not like to be there, okay? So it turns out that magic angle graphene, schematically, looks like this. There are these regions of A, A stacking where all of the carbon atoms on the two layers are on top of each other, and the electrons like to be there. And there are these ABBA regions where the electrons do not like to be. The more realistic schematic, this is what magic angle graphene looks like. You have these two hexagonal lattices. You can see the Moiré pattern that it creates. There are these regions which I colored a little bit in yellow where the electrons like to be and the other regions the electrons do not like to be. This is going to be the equivalent of that ultra cold atoms lattice I showed you at the beginning. The electrons, we're gonna place them there and we're gonna do physics with them. Separation between these, you know, yellow balls here, the moiré lattice, is a four to ten nanometers, as I mentioned earlier. And this is a very convenient end scale. Gives you a very convenient energy scale to look at all of these phenomena. Okay, so let me show you how we actually do this. Okay, and this is very you know easy to understand. So we start with a glass slide. Transparent glass light is almost as simple as the scotch tape, okay? Not quite, but almost. We have this glass light and we have a sticky polymer. Okay? Something that is sticky, similar to scotch tape, a little bit different. Then we bring a substrate which has hexagonal boronitride. Remember, hexagonal boronitride was this insulator. It is, this is about 10 nanometers thick. We just want to use it as a substrate, put graphene on top, okay? It's a high quality substrate. We pick it up with this sticky polymer. Just pick it up, okay? Yeah? Now we bring a different substrate with a graphene sheet on top, like the same you know, to the one that I showed you, okay? Silicon substrate with a graphene sheet. And we position very carefully this boron nitride to halfway, the edge of the boron nitride is now halfway on top of the graphene. Okay? Go down and the boron nitride, say a little bit lifted with the graphene, so I can hear half of the graphene. Okay, on the top view, now I have my silicon substrate, I have my glass light, I have the polymer, I have the boron nitride with half of the graphene here, and I have the other half of the graphene down there. 
but because these two pieces come from the same affine crystal, the atoms in one part are aligned with the angle with the atoms on the other part, yeah? the other graphene sheet. Then we can rotate by any angle that I want, for example, 1.1 degrees, why not? Yeah? I can shift now this on top and I can stack it. And this is how I form those two atomic lattices which are at 1.1 degrees. It's this simple, okay? Me and, you know, I have high school students that do this in place, in the lab, okay? It's really very simple. And then you remove the two graphene sheets and then we can do a lot of relatively complicated nanofabrication processing to make sure we can have electrodes attached to the tiny structure and also the electronic properties. But it's very standard. Thousands of groups around the world do that type of nanofabrication. We end up with something that, which for those of you with engineering background is a field effect transistor geometry. We have the twisted bilayer graphene. We have hexagonal boronite on both sides, convenient to encapsulate it on both sides. You can contact it with gold electrodes so that we can apply a voltage and measure the current. We have a nearby metallic plate. This is called a gate. This thing allows us to change the density of electrons in the graphene, okay? In the twisted bilayer graphene. Very good. So the thing that my group discovered in, in 2018 was that when you fabricate these type of devices, well, first of all, it was the fabrication itself of the devices, and then when you measure the electronic properties, the graphene is one of the best conductors in the world. It's not a superconductor. It's definitely not an insulator. What we did is we put graphene on top of graphene. You could think, you know, this is like the apple and the orange, right? You would think that graphene on top of graphene would look, taste, feel, smells, you know, like graphene. It does not. So we could make a correlated insulator and we make superconductor. A lot of things which are not correlated insulators or superconductor. So this is something, you know, this is maybe a little bit of a busy slide, but this is the conductance. Conductance is how well the electrons conduct, okay? And they should conduct very well. You can see here that there are these regions of zero conductance doesn't conduct at all this thing. That happens when we place a very precise number of electrons per moire in itself, okay, per soccer ball on that pattern, okay? Two electrons, two holes, and rather than conducting, conducting the whole thing, okay? And we put not just two electrons or two holes, but we put just a little bit, 2.2 on average, mm -hmm. and it becomes a superconductor. Resistance goes to zero, it conducts the best of anything. No dissipation, no heat dissipation, nothing, okay? Which is kind of crazy. This superconductivity, okay? It's electrically tunable, as I told you, I can change it depending, I can go between the insulator and the superconductor depending on how many electrons I put in my lattice, which I do dial in a knob in my lab, okay? So this is something that attracted a lot of attention. In particular, it's very similar, you know, this phase diagram, temperature versus doping, is very similar to the temperature versus doping phase diagram, the high temperature operate superconductors, those exotic you know, materials which we don't understand, okay? There, you, I told you that, at, you know, zero dopant means actually one, one electron per copper atom, okay? You have a motor insulator, and if you dope, you get superconductors. Here we have a correlated insulator at a given density. In this case, it's two electrons, two holes per unit cell. And then when you dope, superconductivity. Okay? Except that this is a theoretical yeah. diagram. If to build it experimentally, you have to grow thousands of crystals do different experiments with different chemistry, with different material classes. This is all done in one shop one device all controlled electronically okay so that's you know part of the reason why this attracted a lot of attention all right let me you go towards the end so that was the twist and now the shout so or, or oh, well the shout was already part of the shout was there let me tell you, you know, more things that have happened so we posted we announced this thing in, in a meeting march meeting of the american physical society in 2018 okay and then what I call the theory tsunami came, you know, which is that within weeks, you know, thousands of physicists around the world started to post articles. This works because of this. No, this works because of that. No, I told you it's impossible to calculate, right? It continues to be impossible to calculate. Everybody had a different prediction for how this works. This is this list now has actually several thousand articles. Okay, so we still don't understand it. We still don't know it, although. Many, you know, recent experimental progress is, is, is really narrowing down the range of possibilities. Ali actually 
Zildi posted something, a very interesting article, narrowing severely down what are the possibilities. It cannot be a free for all anymore now. A little bit more restricted, but it's possible. Okay, even the popular press started to like this thing, you know, and you know, people started posting, you know, it's super cool graphics. I, I hope we'd like to know how to do this, but I don't know. But you know, <laughs> people were wondering, you know, it's a magic, be kind of things magic. Now, perhaps more importantly than you know, all of this is the fact that. A lot of people started to do experiments also. So we, we, you know, we, our paper was officially published in April 2018, and many things have happened since. So let me just tell you a few of those. First thing that happened is that we reproduce our own results in my lab. Believe it or not, it doesn't always happen that you reproduce what you did. You know, it's like cooking twice and it has to taste as good as both times. It doesn't always happen, okay? But we did it, and we have many, many, many more devices now. More important than you reproducing your own results is that someone else reproduces your results. Only then it becomes real physics, real science. And many, many groups by now independently reproduce our results and extended them to other systems and in very interesting directions, okay? We have seen not just superconductors and correlated insulators, but plenty, plenty other phenomenology characteristic for quantum materials listed before some of the behaviors, which metals, nematicity, little gaps, Schizophrenic transitions, all kinds of crazy things. People seeing quantum materials, we see them in this magic angle graphene and related materials too. We have discovered many other correlated systems. Okay. Yeah. For example, we can take not just graphene on graphene, but we can take two layers of graphene on two layers of graphene. We call that twisted bye-bye. Okay. And it's also a new correlated system. You can twist those transition metal dicalcogenate, those semiconductors that emit light that I told you. You can twist them, also a correlated material. You can do all kinds of things, you know, with many 2D materials. People have, you know, one of the very important things that we discovered is ferromagnetism. You can make a magnet with these two graphene sheets, okay? A single graphene sheet is not a magnet at all. Okay? And they measure something called the quantum anomalous hole okay, effect. It's, it's too hard to explain, but let me just tell you that this ties with topology, with a very important part of mathematics and physics that I mentioned before in my first slide, okay? In fact, this more quantum matter to, to astronomy community, it has meant the merging of several groups, communities of physics, which did not interact much before. Okay? People that did graphene, like myself, people that did only correlated materials, temperature materials, etc., and people that did this topological mass matter physics, they all come together, this more quantum matter. So now you have conferences for many people that, you know, before they didn't used to interact much, actually come together, and that's really, you know, uh, for me personally, it has been it's really interesting. Okay, so lots of people are doing interesting um, local probe studies, looking microscopically what's really going on with that moray patterns, okay? And we are also developing the next generation of moray quantum matters, called that moray magic 3.0 and beyond. Turns out you can do not just two layers, you can do three layers, okay? Two groups, you know, Philip Kim, my advisor at Columbia, and, and my group, we published, you know, on the same week, you take three layers of graphene on top of each other to actually make an even more exotic superconductor, okay? You can also do four layers or five layers. We have now a family of superconductors based on this trick, you know, of alternating these three angles, et cetera. That's very interesting. So we can do all of these things, but I don't know if you noticed, okay, probably not because you know, these acronyms may not mean much, too, but all of this has been done with graphene, or with one of those semiconductors, or with hexagonal boron nitride, three materials. Very simple material, about the simplest materials that we know, okay? But we have actually hundreds and hundreds, thousands of 2D materials, okay? And some of them are very exotic by themselves, just in one atom or one unit cell thickness. So many, many theories are now trying to, call, oh, let's put this on top of each other, let's twist it, let's see what happens, you know? And we have, Many, 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 many possibilities. And this, this is the very beginning, these things. Let me just end by telling you that in addition to electronic, which is what I'm doing, okay? This superconductivity, this insulated behavior is all about electronics. There's also a lot of, what we call it more magic beyond twist electronics. Okay? For example, remember those you know, cold atom physicists which are there doing their cold atom lattices? They thought that, eh? I can maybe also make these twisted, you know, optical lattices, you know, with cold atoms. Okay. We were first proposals theoretical, and now experimentally people have realized twisted by layer optical lattices, which they didn't think about even before the work. 
You can also do this with phonons. Phonons, phonons means vibrations of lattices, okay? So you can do something called vibrating, it's magic angle vibrating plates, acoustic ballet graphene, magic angle ballet ononic graphene, okay? Rather than with electrons, with vibrations of lattices, okay? You can do all of this. You can also do this with photons, twisted moraine, twisted photonics, okay? With photonic moraine lattices. Because it turns out that the very similar concept, you know, as slowing down the electrons, that rather than going from very steep on this flat pancake, you can do similar thing with light. Light, so at the speed of light, in a very high speed, and so when you create these optical photonic lattices, which are twisted, you can slow them down tremendously. Light moves very slowly. Okay? And that can be very interesting for many applications. Actually, this is a huge program now in the US. You can do also more and twisted electrochemistry and catalysis. It turns out those sites where the electrons like to be have special properties that may enable special chemical reactions and catalysis to take place. Okay. So there are now articles, you know, investigating the properties of these more lattices for electrochemistry and catalysis. The last thing is that you know, some of my theoretical physicist friends think that you can even do gravity and theory, things like that, also these more. This is okay. So that is a bit more on the exotic side. So with this, you know, I want to end with you know, the most important slide. You know, this is work done by a large group of people. You know, my students and postdocs. These are some of the faces. Isaac is here in this this week at this conference. Many more, many more collaborators at many institutions all over the world. And I'm glad that we're finally back to this type of events. You know, after the pandemic, and of course we count with a lot of support both from the federal government and various. Nations, I want to thank you all for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. I hear the Aspen uh, crowd is a very tough audience uh, with questions. So there, I'm a bit nervous, but okay. I have an easy one for you. All right. What's the high temperature that you see lines of graphene have exhibit superconductivity at? <laughs> Oh, yeah, I have to repeat the questions because there's an audience in Zoom and so that this also gets recorded. So what's the highest temperature at which twisted bilayer graphene has which superconductivity? So the highest temperature is about three Kelvin, three, four Kelvin. Okay. That may seem like a very low temperature. It is. But density of electrons in this system, you remember, my electrons are not each atom. They are in this, separated by these 10 nanometers. This is the most diluted the lowest density of electrons superconductor in the world by far, okay? You take another superconductor with a critical temperature of one Kelvin aluminum, which is used on all quantum computers nowadays. Okay? That has 10,000, 100,000 times actually larger density of electrons. So I didn't, I had one slide, but I removed it at the very end because I thought it was going to be too technical, but thanks for the question. Electrons, when they become superconductors, when a material becomes superconductors, electrons form pairs, called Cooper pairs. How strongly together connected are these two electrons in a pair finds uh, that critical temperature, okay? Electrons in graphene are the strongest bound electrons given their density by far of any material that we know, okay? But one of the things that the community is interested in is like, you know, if you would have told people I have this density of electrons in this material. What will be the superconducting critical temperature? They would have guessed 10 to the minus three Kelvin. You know, if you tell them it's one Kelvin, they're like, how can this be? These are too strongly coupled. And we don't understand exactly why they're so strongly coupled. Part of the interest in, in this field is, let's see if we can understand why that glue that binds together these two electrons is so strong, because maybe then we can design materials regular electron densities, like regular materials, not this more material, but regular electron densities, and then they would be way above room temperature superconductors. We could figure out the whole thing, okay? It's not clear that that will ever happen, but that's one of the things that one can think of. Is there any connection with this or any application related to rare earth elements? Mm -hmm. So, oh yeah, is there any application connected to rare earth elements? So, I think it's carbon very abundant element. But some of the semiconductors that I mentioned, I showed tungsten diselenide, and there are many others, molybdenum disulfide, molybdenum ditelluride, they contain rare earth elements. These are all semiconductors. They're very interesting, not just because they have interesting electronic properties, similar to 
not similar, but you know, like graphene, they have interesting electronic properties. They also have interesting optical properties. And those all have rare earth elements. So it's a potential substitute for rare earth. Oh, you mean that? If they if this could substitute applications for which yeah, now we need rare earth elements. Um, so, uh, you know, this field of twistronics is super young. Okay. And right now, this is we're mostly having fun enjoying the physics. Beautiful. It's interesting. We do it because we like it. Okay. Um, however, it's a difference to other fields of physics. Our field of physics often has applications. And, you know, when we understand something, we hand it over to the engineers. They do something useful with it. Okay? For magic angle graphene, et cetera, there are many applications that one could envision and could think of. Okay? And um, some of them are related to energy harvesting, to photodetectors, to technologies for which now we use toxic or very rare materials. But we have quite a way to go to get there. Now it's mostly basic research. How do you place the electrons? <laughs> very good. It's not that I place them like I take them with my hand and I put them there, right? What we do is in, in this um, field effect transistor geometry, let me uh, see, go, wait. Let me go to that slide. Geometry. <laughs> So, so we have this twisted bilayer graphene, okay? And we have this plate you know, that we call a gate. It's a metallic plate. This thing, the metal, this thing is a metal. We form a parallel plate capacitor. If we apply a voltage between this piece of metal and the twisted bilayer graphene, electrons flow into the twisted bilayer graphene. Once they flow there, their regions, where it is energetically favorable for them to be, regions where it's not favorable for them to be. And that's what determines where they go. And as I told you, electrons like to be in those AA regions, okay? Uh, can you tell me more about like, what a Klein, uh, what Klein tun tunneling is and how it kind of uh, uh, appears in this situation? So, for, for remember, I spoke about Klein tunnel in the context of just graphene, okay, not magic and graphene. But for electrons in graphene, they um, let me actually go back to that slide. Actually, rather than the Einstein slide, let me go to the one where cons were. <laughs> Okay. It's energy momentum dispersion, okay? Tells you what, what is in that Klein tunnel, what happens is you have an electron which sits here, okay? When you have present an obstacle to the electron, okay? The obstacle for electron, electron interacts via Coulomb interaction with objects, electrostatics. So an obstacle means an electrostatic barrier, okay? But it turns out that this electron you put an electrostatic barrier, rather than bouncing back, as electrons do, what it can do is it can turn itself into a hole, okay? Because of, because of this, because there's no gap here, okay? because this linear energy momentum dispersion, this electron, when it sees an electrostatic barrier, can say like, oh, if I was a hole, I would not see this barrier. It would be like a potential well for me, because holes are positive and it's attractive. And then you can sort of, do that process, electron hole conversion, and go through obstacles which are electrostatic barriers. I don't know, this is a bit technical perhaps, but. Uh, so because of the uh, conversion to a hole is what makes it different from quantum tunneling? Yeah, regular regular electrons, okay? Yeah. The dispersion, which is parabolic, you know, it's, it's like this, okay? And this electron, in order to make it into a hole has to cross this thing, which is called a gap, is to pay an energy penalty, you know. As in graphene, there's no gap, so you can do it for free. It doesn't have to suffer that penalty, and that's why it can make this process efficiently. So how did you 
need to look at this one degree in your lab because I know you necessarily didn't believe the theorists. <laughs> yeah, never, never believe theories, the theorems, as in right. So, you know, so the the thing is, so for me, you know, I always tell my students, for me, doing research is like going into the jungle, you know, and exploring, you know, not knowing where you're gonna go, where you're gonna end up. Which is a bit unnerving for many students, you know, because you throw them out in the jungle, lions, I don't know what. Yes. So, um, so when when the study materials, you know, when it became obvious that you can put material, study materials on top of each other, very quickly many people thought, oh, you can put them at some angle. And in this field of condensed matter physics, again, because it's very difficult to calculate things, as I mentioned earlier, there are often many surprises. And surprises happen when you look in areas where no one has looked before. So for me, it was like, oh, wow, no one, this was impossible to do before. Must, there must be something interesting going on here when you look at this thing. So we started to work on this twisting, you know, even before we were aware of those theoretical predictions. But then when the theoretical predictions came, we thought like, hmm, you know, we're going to look at angles. Why don't we look at 1.1? 1.1, we had no idea if it was right. We had no idea how precisely we had to be 1.1. We started playing around, pulling around. So we had a paper in 2012 with some big angles. And in 2016, small angles, not 1.1, but small. But back already in 2016, we realized that small is good. There were already some exotic things going on. And I told my, my very talented student, and so let's go for 1.1. Let's see if we can make it. And that's how. But we weren't anticipated superconductivity correlating. So none of that had been predicted. It was like, just go there and see what happens. Okay. And then way beyond, you know, much more happened than what we thought it could happen. So, but uh, again, it was, it was risky for my student. Maybe nothing was going to happen. I would have wasted, you know, two years, but you know, a lot would happen. So take risks. That's my advice to all the young people take risks. Yeah, on that note, let's thank Babylon. Thank you. Thank you.